Our work on dreams to begin is based on the study of written reports of dreams. We cannot really study dreams as they happen, but only reports of dreams. So I always refer, or I hope I refer, to the study of dream reports to make this point clear. What's unique about our work is this, in the study of dreams is that we rely on nothing but uh, the dream reports themselves to understand the meaning of dreams. Unlike the clinical study of dreams, which is associated with names like Freud and Jung, we do not want a case history, do we do not want free associations, amplifications, metaphoric parallels, symbolic interpretations. We want to know nothing of the dreamer, and we do not want to go outside of the dream reports themselves to understand the meaning of dreams. Now, I would contend to you that this is the only scientific way to study dream meaning, but I really don't have time to make that argument in detail here uh, tonight. The basic point is that we can't manipulate an independent variable to induce or cause dreams. When dreams are going on, we can tickle somebody or drop water on them and get a little bit of, of turbulence in the content, but really not much. And furthermore, we can't observe uh, dreams as they're happening. We can't get reports on them as they're happening. It's always after the fact. To give you the simple contrast, we can do things in a lab, and psychologists often do such things, that would might make you say angry. And then we can see that you are angry. And you can tell us uh, that you're angry while you're feeling angry. But the point is you can't do that with dreams. You can't make them happen. And you can only get reports after the fact, after the dream is over. And that makes it a very difficult topic to study in any systematic way. In other words, we can't be experimental uh, about dreams. As for the clinical approach, which is the most typical approach, it is retrospective. It is always arguing backwards. It cannot really demonstrate any kind of, of, of causality. It cannot escape the possibility that suggestion, ideology, and other factors are guiding the interpretation. Dream interpretations may sound convincing to you, or one or another theory may, but that's because in a way you've really bought into the assumptions of that theory, whereas we're trying to really study the kinds of assumptions that, that people make. Well, before I tell you what we do with these dream reports, I need to talk about the quality of our data, meaning the accuracy or representativeness, as we say in psychology, of the dream reports uh, in terms of how they relate to the dream life of people in general, because I'm going to talk about everybody here uh, tonight. In psychological terms, that is, the question is, do we have a representative sample of people, and do those people give us a representative, representative sample of their, of their dreams? Now those are the crucial questions for my fellow social scientists. And the answer is, yes we do, to both questions. Now I don't have time, once again, to argue the case here. And it might uh, lose interest for some of you that aren't social scientists, and maybe even some of you that are social scientists. But the basic point is that we find few or no differences on personality and cognitive tests between those who report dreams and those who don't. And we find few or no differences between dreams collected from awakenings in a sleep lab and dreams recalled under everyday conditions. Moreover, we find few or no differences between dreams in the lab from early in the night, that is, we awaken you right after you've fallen asleep, and the last uh, dream of the night. And since it's very often the last dream of the night that you're remembering and then writing down as a dream report, it follows that we have a representative sample of dream life. And these claims are based on work that I was part of in the 60s and that others have, have replicated since. Well, I recognize that I'm now pushing on the limits of your patience by not getting down to it. What do we do with these reports? What do we find? Uh, well, we do what's called, I'm still not there, that's what the warning is. Uh, what we do is called quantitative content analysis of these reports, which means we have developed a carefully defined set of categories into which we can place each element of a report. For example, types of characters, like animals or strangers or friends or relatives. We then count the frequency of the elements in each category, and then we go on to compute uh, percentages and ratios to correct for differences in dream length and other things that might uh, uh, make for differences that aren't, aren't real. And then finally, we compare the findings with norms. By norms, we mean typical uh, findings. Well, even that's a mouthful, I recognize. I'm still out there in social science orbit. But what I'm saying is, that number one, we construct categories. Number two, we code for frequencies. Number three, we figure percentages and ratios. 
And four, we compare with norms. That may sound fancy, but it's really very simple. It just happens to take a lot of time to do it. And I think my examples will make it clear if it isn't from what I've said. Uh, but first, I want to tell you that these categories were developed by writing down everything that appeared in thousands of dreams. This was one of the projects of Calvin Hall. And he gradually looked at ways to group those elements that seemed to make uh, sense in just a common sense kind of way and, and closely related to that, that he could get the same sortings uh, many different times. That is the important point I want to get across to you is there was no preconceived idea on the categories. They were not derived from any one theory, not any theory at all, but only from our everyday thought patterns, which I recognize for the philosophers in the audience does involve our implicit theories of the world. But nonetheless, we like to call those empirical uh, categories. The result is, and now I'm finally to it, that dreams look like a play, like a play on the stage through our categories. First, there's a setting. Setting could be indoors, it could be outdoors, it could be familiar, it could be unfamiliar, it could be in some way distorted from what it usually looks like. Second, there are characters, animals or people. If they're people, they could be friends or strangers. They could be young or old, they could be male or female, or many other uh, ways that we have of classifying characters in dream. Third, there are social interactions, the plot of the play, so to speak. Very often those are aggressions. That's the most frequent kind of interaction in dreams, as we'll see. We also talk about friendly uh, interaction. And finally, and much less than you would think from the stereotype beliefs about dreams, uh, there are sexual uh, interactions. There are also, in addition to settings and characters and social interactions, there are the props or objects of the dreams. There be guns or hammers or flowers or trees or clothes. Uh, there are also emotions in dreams, and they're mostly negative, I might uh, uh, add there. We have other categories as well. That it's a very detailed. For instance, we have a category called misfortune. That's when anything bad happens that wasn't caused by human agent. So if a tree falls on you, that's a misfortune. If you get sick, that's a misfortune. If somebody hits you, that's an aggression uh, in the dreams. Now in your handout, and there won't be a quiz, so don't be nervous about that. In your handout uh, that I've given you for a later look, it's really a later look saying, was, was he really serious or what was he talking about? There are two examples of our scoring categories, the first two pages. One for friendliness and one for misfortunes. And all I want you to get a sense of for now is that, is that how detailed the coding rules are. Very detailed on what a friendliness is and what different kinds of friendliness are, what a misfortune is, and so on. Why that's essential is that it's necessary to obtain what psychologists call reliability, which means repeatability or consistency of scoring. That is, if I scored 50 dreams tonight and then scored them 50, 50 dreams, the same 50 next week, but I get the same results. If I scored the dreams and then you scored the dreams, would we get the same uh, results? And once again, I will be very brief at all the hard parts where my colleagues would quiz me. I move real fast, right past that particular point. And I want to say that um, we get excellent reliability. Uh, scorers, that is, or coders, I use those two terms interchangeably. In fact, in the 50s and 60s, we talked about scoring dreams, and now we talk about coding. So I slip back and forth a little bit. We get excellent reliability. Scores come, that is, uh, to the same result. Okay, that said, we turn finally to the results after all of that wind up. The results I'm going to uh, talk about first, I'm going to talk about our norms, our typical findings, our percentages and ratios, for college men and women in 1950 at Case Western Reserve University, where Calvin Hall once taught, in Cleveland, Ohio. These are norms based on 500 male and 500 female dream reports. Five dreams picked out of a larger series from each of 100 men and women. Well, that may seem like a long time ago and a faraway place, but we have replicated those norms with reports from the University of Richmond in Virginia in 1980, from Salem College in in uh, North Carolina in 1989, and, and as I said, at good old Berserkley in 1986 in Veronica Tone's study. And I think that's when my confidence started to grow. If uh, California students were dreaming our norms in 1986, my confidence started to grow a little bit. In short, I think these norms, quite frankly, are a rock to stand on. 
And the fact that they're built on a very narrow band of people in terms of age and socioeconomic level and educational level is their strength. It is not, not a weakness. Because we can build out from them, as uh, I will soon argue. Starting from these norms, we can look for age differences, cross-cultural differences, ethnic and class differences, and individual differences. And when we do that, what we find is that the most impressive differences are individual differences with certain cross-cultural exceptions. We don't have the greatest samples in the world yet for ethnicity and class, but they seem to be very minor issues um, in dreams, which is one of the things that always creates attention for me with my sociologist colleagues and with myself because I think class and ethnicity are enormously important uh, in the waking world. But in dreams, they don't show up uh, very much at all. We dream about personal things. Dreams are soap operas is the, be the basic kind of point. But you notice these replications, I think, are also our first important finding. There have been no historical changes in what college students in the USA dream about. Well, why is that? The answer is I don't know. I'm an empirical psychologist. I have theories of sociology, but I'm just kidding a little bit there, too. I'll say something about it later. But I don't honestly know why they have not uh, changed. Well, now we're ready to look at the third page of the handout. Those are the norms. We're not going to look at all those numbers. I just wanted you to have them uh, for fun. But I want to start with a seemingly minor and very mundane finding that allows me to explain our system to you and show the power of our results all at once. It's the first one on the page. It's called animal percent up there at the top. Now, the animal percent is the total number of animals in a um, set of reports divided by the total number of characters uh, in those reports. By turning this into a percentage, this corrects for the fact that some people write longer reports than others. In fact, there can be dramatic differences in how long a report they write. And on average, a report from women is about 6% longer than a report uh, from men. This also corrects for the fact that you may have dreams that have relatively few characters in them. And other people may have dreams that have a whole lot of characters in them. The point is that by turning it into a percentage, we're correcting for that. And incidentally, women also, on average, have more characters in their dreams, uh, independent of the length of the report. So animal percent is a way of quickly correcting for the kinds of problems uh, that you have in a real simple, straightforward kind of content analysis, and it allows us to talk about anybody's animal percent anywhere in the world. Well, on the handouts, you'll see that the uh, animal percent for men is 6%, and the animal percent for women, now always I'm meaning uh, college, uh, our norms, is 4%. Uh, that's no big deal finding. That's a very small uh, gender difference. What would make this finding interesting? Well, aha. First of all, the animal percent is very, very high in children, ages 5 to 10. As high as 40 to 50 percent of the characters in children's dreams are animals, and then it goes down. Does that surprise any of you? You'd say, no, that doesn't surprise me, but that's the important point. It starts to tell you something about dream content and its relationship to our waking preoccupations. Now, I want to talk about pre-industrial societies, the kind of societies that uh, anthropologists have, have studied so frequently in the past. Well, the point I just want to make for now, though, is that in pre-industrial societies, the dream reports have a much higher animal percent, especially in hunting and gathering society. Is that earth-shaking? Is that a surprise? No. But it starts to suggest that dreams relate to culture. Now I want to take a third case on animal percent, and that's Japan. We have a study of college students in Japan. The animal percent in their dreams is less than 1%. Less than 1%. Far lower than the United States. Hey, this is a place that's very crowded with people. There aren't many animals there. You're not allowed to have pets in a lot of, if not all, Japanese cities. And indeed, if we looked at the dreams of the, of the Japanese students in terms of people per line, so to speak, the dreams are more dense with people. And there's more familiar people. Our dreams have more strangers in them than do the dreams of the Japanese students. Well, that gives you a feel, I think, for our system. You see the cultural differences, the age differences, and you start to say, well, and again, I, I don't think any of these findings are, like, earth-shaking, and, and that's their beauty. But let's jump down the page to the middle to aggression. And let's look there at, a, at uh, gender differences. Given the nature of our society, it probably doesn't surprise you that there's a higher aggression to character ratio, where it says AC ratio there, for males than there is for females. 
There's also more physical aggression in male dream reports. And women are more often a victims of aggression in their dreams than are men, although it's important to notice there that both males and females are over 50% on that ratio. That is, in our dreams, we are all more often victims than we are aggressors. None of that comes as a, as a surprise, but what I'm doing is building the evidence for what we call the continuity hypothesis. There is a continuity between our dream life and our waking life. Sometimes that continuity is with only our thoughts, sometimes it's with our thoughts and behaviors, something I don't have time to get into tonight, and it's also one of the places where we've got a lot more research uh, to do. Well, let's take one final quick look at something in the norms that's not an obvious finding. That's uh, right there below animal percent. It's called the male-female percent. Males dream uh, more about other males, 67 to 33. Whereas women dream 50-50 of males and females. Why the difference? That's not obvious to me in terms of our, our culture. And the answer, of course, is we don't know why there's that difference. But if we make the hypothesis that dreams express our preoccupations, then maybe we can say men are more preoccupied with other men and women are equally preoccupied with both genders. And then we start to look for ways to, to study that claim. And we, for instance, if we looked at the aggressive and friendly interactions, in men's dreams, we'd find that men tend to fight with other men in their dreams and have friendly interactions with women. But if we look at women's dreams, they're as equally likely to have a friendly or an aggressive interaction with uh, both genders. And if preoccupations are often with what scares us and makes us nervous and is a problem for us, then, uh, then men being two-thirds of the characters in men's dreams would not be as surprising uh, if we think in terms of this rivalry and competition. We also at that point might look outside dreams as we did and we say, what's those ratios look like in short stories written by men? What's it look like in short stories written by women? And lo and behold, it's exactly uh, the same ratio in the study that we did. So that dream ratio is also the ratio that we found in stories. But I don't want to perseverate on any one finding, uh, particularly this male-female percent. I'm going to show later when I talk about individual differences though, why something like male-female percent can be so useful. Okay, so now we've got the norms behind us. What are some of our other findings? Well, let's look at age. Basically, I want to say to you that after age 22, age doesn't matter very much. We have not found that dreams change very much. Our norms work for American adults. Two bases for saying that. First, what we call a cross-sectional study, which just simply means We've collected dreams from 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds and 50-year-olds and 60-year-olds, that kind of study. But secondly, something I'll talk about more in a minute, we have some longitudinal studies. We have what we call long dream series over decades from uh, a handful of people. And age is just not a big factor um, in those dreams. Now, from age 5 or 6 to uh, 16 or 17, there are changes in dream content. I mentioned one with the animal percent. The others are fairly minor too, but one of the, that's of interest is that children are much more often like uh, to be victims of aggression in their dreams. If it's a much higher, the victimization percent is much higher. There's other little ones, but I don't want to uh, dwell on those here uh, tonight. They are very consistent with what we might expect in terms of, of age. Now I want to look at uh, cross-cultural studies where we have many samples. And, and the basic point is that dreams all over the world, dream reports all over the world, are more similar than they are different. The male-female percent rarely varies from society to society. In every sample Calvin Hall looked at, there was more aggression than friendliness. We are more likely to be victims than aggressors. There was more likely to be misfortune than good fortune. In the studies of, of college students in India and Japan, it's almost stunning how similar um, the amount of objects and activities and the distribution in the various categories are with our, our norms. But there are also cross-cultural differences. I've already met, mentioned this relatively minor one of the animal percent. But the biggest and most interesting difference is precisely around aggression. Even though I've said to you there's more aggression and friendliness, there's even more aggression in some societies than in others, particularly physical aggression. And there you can take a look at the next page of the handout. And what I put there in big bold letters with a few of the societies to give you an idea is that there's much more physical aggression, and this is for males, uh, in pre we don't have many dream reports from 
uh, women in these societies. Much more physical aggression for males in pre-industrial societies. And that aggression, incidentally, is often with uh, animals. In the United States, though, you'll notice, it's higher than any other advanced capitalist society. And we are, by all accounts, far and away the most aggressive society among the advanced capitalist societies. And if I had the Japanese data in here, which I don't because I couldn't quite know for sure what they were saying on certain points, even though it was in English, they didn't quite figure the ratios the way we do is another way to put it. It would be even lower. The amount of aggression in the dreams of the uh, Japanese college students was uh, extremely uh, low. Well, what these age and cross-cultural findings do for me, and what hopefully would do for you, is to give you confidence that our system of coding is relating to something real in the world. That is, in the terms of psychologists, this system has some validity. It connects to something outside of dreams. But what I'd argue to you is that if we're going to understand dreams, that if we're really going to understand in detail about dreams, we're not out to understand culture or age. Uh, indeed, there's better ways to study age differences or cultural differences than looking at dreams. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced. If we're interested in studying dreams, though, our main focus has to be on individual subjects in our culture. That is, the best subjects for us, for the research I do, are people eager to help, to whom we have easy access, who will write down their dreams, who are, and who are willing to answer questions based on our inferences. So I'm going to close my remarks on dreams here tonight by talking about some studies we've done of individuals with these long dream series that I mentioned to you before. That is a lot of dreams from one person, especially dream series where we have over 100 dreams from the person. 100 has become my magic number in this research. Why is that? Because if we score a dream series that has several hundred dreams, or in some cases thousands of dreams, and then see how many dreams does it take, dream reports from that series, to match our overall results, the answer is about 100 looking at all of our categories. For some of our categories uh, would have a big N in them like characters, the, the stability starts to show up by 25 to 50 uh, dream reports. Well, there's a place where you can see this in the handout on the next page, where at the top of the page it says the engine man. This is somebody we're going to study a lot more. This is a man who wrote down his dreams for his own purposes at age 45 in 1939. He wrote them down, just hand into a notebook. Nothing ever came of him. His estate was passed on to his sister. His sister sold his library to an antiquarian book dealer. And a psychiatrist at Harvard a few years ago saw it listed in the, the, the sales. And he bought this amazing journal uh, of this uh, particular man. And he called him the engine man because he loved trains. He clearly loved trains. And he give in loving detail, he described the, the big locomotives that had come through his dreams, whether it was a six-wheeler or a four-wheeler, and he'd often draw on the margin a, a picture of just what that train uh, looked like. Well, one of our many fine psychology students here, Adam Schneider, who served as my RA last summer, did an analysis that you see on the handout page. First, you see on the left-hand side the overall findings with, uh, I guess it's 193 or so dreams. Uh, then you see a comparison of the two halves only one, of, one or two of those differences in the categories under aggression is unlikely to be due to chance. That is, that it's a systematic difference as opposed to just a little random uh, fluctuation when he did a uh, statistical test. Now, if you look at the four numbers on the right, which are based on smaller sets of the series, uh, you see there's more variation um, in, the, uh, in the numbers. And that, the point I'm trying to make to you then is that's why I talk about 90 to 100 dreams and the kind of stability that you get. And if you look closer a little later, you might say, hey, there's some trends in those categories. Some things are going up a little bit. Some things might be going down a little bit. And that does happen in long dream series, but it's something I don't uh, quite have enough data with him. We only have him over three months, and I don't know quite enough of, of, about him. There's one other thing I want to say about him. If you look under his animal percent, it's pretty high. This guy's up at 9% one time and 14% another, something like that. Pretty high animal percent. What's going on here? Hey, he was born on a farm in Iowa, and his lifelong occupation was an entomologist. He was an entomologist for the U.S. government, it turned out, when after we'd done this, I, um, a Berkeley professor who uh, is an entomologist but also studies the history of the discipline, he sent me an obit on this man from an entomology journal. There he was. I mean, bugs and animals were his life. And they are big um, 
in, uh, in his dreams. But there's a way in which I want to rush, rush past the engine man to tell you briefly of some other studies with long dream series. Because what they do is reveal this astonishing consistency in our measures over decades in some cases. And we call that the consistency hypothesis. It complements our continuity a hypothesis. I tell you first of Dorothea. Dorothea wrote her dreams down for 50 years. Very little change in those dreams. She wrote them down all her life for her own reasons. Only when she was in her 60s did she write Calvin Hall and say, gee, I see you do this dream research. Would you like to have these dreams? And he said, you bet I would. And he continued to send her dreams uh, until four days before her death at age uh, 76. And he studied those dreams in every which way possible, including looking for more emphasis on the past in her dreams when she was older, and virtually uh, no change. But there were certain changes. There were less men in her dreams in old age. She had a very low male-female percent uh, when she got into her 70s. But as last as we men know, there are less men around when women are in their 70s. And indeed, she lived in a women's retirement home in the last four or five years of her life, and there were very few men in her life. There was also less illness and less travel in her dreams later on, and indeed she traveled less and she was ill less. She had a marvelous health right up till a week or two before uh, she died. And then there's Jason, over 20 years. Once again, amazing stability in his dreams, but he, I want to focus on him for another reason. He moved from the west coast to the east coast at a certain point, and it was possible for us to study the gradual replacement of his old friends in his dreams with his new friends. And so, after a number of years, all the old friends were gone, and there were a new set of friends in the dream. But there's one thing that had not changed, the percentage of his characters that were friends. That is, he always had the same certain percentage of friends uh, in his dream. Now, he also had variation from year to year in how frequently men and women appeared in his dreams, certain men and women. But his male and female percent always remained right on the money. 67, 33. That is, sometimes many different men would appear in his dream a few times. But at other times, there'd be a few men making a lot of appearances in his dreams, but always the male-female percent stayed the same. And my point to you is, with just those two examples, that these and many other findings suggest to us a deep structure to our dream psyche that's pumping out a certain percentage of indoor or outdoor settings, or males or females, or friendly or aggressive or what, over uh, decades um, at a time. Now, Dorothea and Jason also allow me to talk of this continuity hypothesis uh, that I mentioned at the individual level. For instance, one of the things that's most striking about Dorothea's dreams is there are virtually no sex dreams. Uh, as low as sex dreams are in our norms, she maybe had two or three that she reported uh, her whole life. And we don't believe that this was due to a reluctance to report, because first of all, she never planned to give these to anybody, as far as we know, for the first 40 or so years. And secondly, she reported a couple of very vivid sex dreams in her early 70s. The prediction would be she had a relative lack of interest in, in sexuality, and this was her report to us when asked that, and she offered the fact she was a lifelong virgin, and that sex had not been any significant factor in her life. If we turn to Jason, he was incredibly low on aggression for a male and indeed was a very unaggressive person in waking life. Well, we have similar evidence of consistency and continuity for maybe 10 or 15 other long dream series for everyday people. We also have them for some famous people like Kafka. He wrote his dreams in his diaries. Uh, they can be kind of fun. We also have them for some infamous people. 1,300 dreams from a child molester who wrote them down desperately and in the various mental hospitals and prisons where he was kept uh, from his middle 20s till his... Uh, mid or, middle 40s. But I want to close with our analysis done by a Adam Schneider for me of a recent student series that we call Person One. Also gives you a little idea of what I've been doing with students in class in the last few years. A lot of fun for me. Person One's a male here at UCSC. Uh, we knew nothing about Person One. Uh, we get these scores and then we make guesses uh, about him. And in this case, Person One had a male-female percent of 3961, almost reverse of the usual percent, very atypical. And the guess was that there had been no male presence in his life in the early years, and he did confirm that was the case. I shouldn't call it a guess, the inference. 
The other inference was he greatly preferred the companionship of women than of men, and this also was true. Person one also extremely low on aggression in dream, and this is true in waking life. In short, what this says is that the wave of the future for this kind of work in our future studies is to do what we call blind analysis, detailed inferences on people based only on dream reports. And then we have the dreamer or the dreamer's therapist or the dreamer's significant others confirm or disconfirm uh, what we've uh, put forward. Well, in conclusion on the substance of the matter on dreams, I have no doubt whatsoever that dreams have meaning and often very deep meaning. I believe they reveal our conceptions, our conceptions of ourself and of others. Do we conceive of ourselves as victims? Do we conceive of ourselves as uh, isolated with few friends? Do we conceive of ourselves as aggressors? Do we conceive of our parents as helpful? Do we conceive of friends as uh, supportive and so on? All of those things really come through in our uh, system. They also, dreams also reveal our preoccupations. 100 dreams is as pure a psychological portrait of a person as I believe can be constructed. And I've only been able to scratch the surface of that here tonight.